Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we're taking a hatchet to the systems of society uh, with Emil Durkheim. Emil Durkheim. Yes. Uh, but before we get started, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Green Zebra from the Founders Brewing Company in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm excited about yeah, this beer. Me too. Uh, we actually did a poll on did. our Instagram and Facebook, and uh, of the three, this one went out. Do you yeah. know what else there was? Uh, there was a coconut porter, and let's see, there was something by Avery Brewing Company was the coconut porter. Uh, there was this one, and there was something by. Wow, I feel really bad that I'm forgetting now. I'm just excited Someone about else. this because it's founders, and yes. you know they're 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 oftentimes a a really good oh yeah good uh good scoring beer for us. So Ooh. the other one was uh, summer ale or sorry summer love ale by Victory Brewing. Company. I haven't tried it yet, but that smell oh just wait. Yes, yeah. it's a Gosa style ale, which is going to mean it's a little bit oh. sour and a little bit oh. light. Should be great for a summer beer. This is going to be exciting. Yes. So, I got to tell you, when you brought this to me, I I, I vaguely remember the the. God, that smells amazing. I vaguely remember this philosopher from uh, my education psychology classes in college, yes. uh, but couldn't really I, I couldn't really uh, remember the details about him. So I went looking, and he's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, I, I I found myself. Uh, Cheering him and arguing with him at the same time all yes. the way through. Yeah. So um, I, I'm looking forward to see what you're going to do with this bus. Yeah, it should be good. I'm going to run it into the wall. That's what I'm going to do. Again? No, sorry. Are you being <laughs> mugged? What? No. No. <laughs> sorry. We're doing Durkheim, not uh, Keynes. Okay. Yeah, there, you go. there you go. So anyway. Um, so for those unfamiliar, Emil Durkheim was primarily a sociologist, although one of the things, if you have listened to our show for a while... Um, you'll know is that we do tend to fear off of strict philosophy and we yep. sort of delve into sociology and psychology from time to time. And whatever Politics else you want to talk history. about. Yeah. Um, but those, uh, those topics are sort of their sister. That, well, uh, they are. If philosophy is the study of wisdom, which, you know, that, that's what it translates as is Greek, mm -hmm. then, then I think sociology falls in that. I think it's, I think it's a, a, a school of, so, of, of philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned that he's, he's a sociologist. He's, he's oftentimes called the father of sociology. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that is because the thing that he strove for in his life was to, um, to have the study of society done in a systematic fashion that could be um, tested and and the results could be repeated. He wanted it to be taken seriously as yep. a science and not just as a, a theory and, and a practice. Mm -hmm. do, you, uh, do you want me to kind of drop this guy in time a little bit before we get started? I was oh, yes. actually hoping you would. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a he's a Frenchman he's uh, he's living in at, at the at the end of the 1800s start of the 1900s uh, a product of the third French Republic and and knowing that helps us understand what was going on uh, during you know, if, if you look at his lifetime uh, coming at, he was born in 1858 right as the third French Republic was forming okay and France had had three uh, I'm sorry, two republics, an empire, and a monarchy in the last 50 years. So he comes from a system where France was really just coming out of a very unstable period. Right. Uh, France was also going through the same thing that the rest of the world was going through. This is the Industrial Revolution. And the whole world was changing at this time period. We were shifting from societies uh, that were very closed, very family-oriented, uh, very much class-based to societies of, of capitalism and, and, and the free market. And there was a great deal of, uh, of unrest in society. And I don't think you can have, uh, I don't think you can have this if you're 
if you're not in that particular time period. <laughs> right, right. So that kind of gives us an idea of you know what was going on in the world. He's also a contemporary of, of Karl Marx, who dealt with a lot of the same issues. Right. Um, yeah, him, Karl Marx, and there was one other. I Friedrich forget. Engels. Yeah, uh, are yeah. considered kind of the, the, the trio that started yeah. sociology yeah. altogether. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and did not agree on a lot of things. Yes. Yeah, I should have taken down the names of them specifically, but I think there I have was. I in my notes. Okay, there was functionalism, which was uh, this Durkheim. Um, there was the one that essentially says that um, society is made up of different groups of people interacting and struggling for power, which was Marx. Uh-huh. Um, don't remember what the name of that one was. Um, Communism. Communism. Well, <laughs> no, okay, I, no. I, I know, I know. I'm joking. <laughs> well, but it was. Yeah. Well. That was not. That was the economic system, yeah. not not the sociological yes. system. But it's but it's but that's what it is. Yeah, and yeah. then the other one that essentially was kind of advocating spontaneous order that people just kind of came together and were doing their own thing, and it which is fascinating. Society formed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so when you look at those three, you see where they counter each other a lot. Um, and I think that were you to ask most people, they would think it was some amalgamation thereof. That's a yeah. good word, by the way. Love amalgamation is a great one. I know. Well, this show brought to you by Amalgamation. <laughs> <laughs> Mix yes. some things together once in a while. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you yes. know it has to be by oh, Google. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. by Google. Of course. By Google. Um, so talk to us a little bit about this, uh, about this philosopher. Okay. Um, I actually was just going to kind of delve in. So one of the things that um, he studied a lot of were social mores. Um, social norms. Social yeah. norms, absolutely. And um, the thing that fascinated me was his um, his definition his of social facts? Yeah, that, um, that was an it was an interesting way to look look at things. Uh, it, I, I think today we'd call it a social norm, but but uh, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so a social fact, according to Durkheim, um, was anything consisting of manners, acting, thinking, and feeling external to the individual, which are invested with a coercive power by virtue of which they exercise control over him. Yeah, yeah. So breaking that down, um, a social fact um, is some... So I guess touching first on external to the individual. Um, This is anything where if it's something that you do and you really, like when you look at it critically, you go, I don't know why the fuck I do that. Yeah, yeah. Like... um, the example that I saw that, that, that fascinated me, and uh, we talked about it a little bit before the show, was, was Christmas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I don't remember who it was that talking about they, they used this as the example, so it's not at all an original idea. But they pointed out, you know, you've got that family, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and you know, nobody wants to buy gifts for anybody right. else. They want to keep their money. Nobody wants to do this stuff. But nobody cri- wants gifts. Yeah. Nobody wants to get mm-hmm. gifts for but other people. But Christmas time, everybody's bought gifts, and there's a big fucking tree in your in, in your yeah. living room, and you're celebrating Christmas because that's the uh, that's the social norm. It's the social fact that exists. Weddings. And 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 he would say uh, that 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 provides a, a unifying factor for yeah. everybody, and it actually creates a a, a, a calm feeling, right? Because there, there's something that we all share. This societal fact. Weddings are a great mm-hmm. example. Uh, when you uh, don't want to get a, do a fucking registry because you don't want fucking gifts and everybody tells mitzvah. you you've got to. A bar mitzvah is a great example. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, sweet 16s, mm-hmm. uh, any of these things that that, that, that we, we all do. Patriotism. Uh, yeah. Stupid mums at homecoming, you know. Oh, my God, mums. Nobody outside of if Texas you're not in knows the South. what that is. Well, wait, Texas. Texas is wait, the only is state that, that does it, yeah. Really? Yeah. By the way, if you're from somewhere else and you don't know what a mum is, look it up. Texas it's, is the South. It, it's a, no, no, no. <laughs> No, no, Texas is not the South. You're right. Texas is the only part of the South that matters. Yeah. Te- Tex- East Texas is the Deep South. The rest of us is the West. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, yeah, look it up one day. Big fucking flower that the w- w- girls wear at homecoming for no fucking reason. They're huge reason. and ridiculous. And heavy. And they've, and got, they've gotten bigger as the years have gone yes, on. Yes. And your social status is determined by how wide the flower is and how long the ribbons are that and hang from it. And sometimes how much how much uh, electrical shit you have on it now because now they yes. light up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how many little baubles you have hanging from it and how many you have. That's right. Because you right. have to have like one on each side of your chest well, and your maybe another one. your boyfriend gives you one. Your parents give yeah. you one. You have yeah. to have one on your arm and one on your wrist yeah. and you know. It, yeah. it, is, it, it is so terrible. It's the, it's the s- money making scheme. The stupidest thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It may be a stupid thing, but my wife has made a great deal of money making oh, yeah. those over the years. <laughs> and the thing about it is, outside of how gaudy they are, it's they're, fun. They're cute. It's fun. Yeah. 
We chased a rabbit, but, you know, I thought I'd, I'd throw that out there anyway. <laughs> yes. But point being that uh, as a high school girl in Texas, um, you have a social pressure you do. to wear a mom to the homecoming football game. And as a high school boy, you better buy one. Yeah. And spend a lot of money on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, moving on from there, um, that kind of, and I guess we can actually use that to reference, to further break this definition down a little bit, um, and, and focus on the coercive power. Yeah. Because that's, that's a, a big focal point of, Mm. of this particular definition and, and what it is that helps a social fact to structure society. I'm just saying, if you don't get to hit somebody, what's the point? <laughs> well, and it, it's not necessarily being hit, but it's it's the potential of being ostracized for it. Um, and it's playing on the fact that we are social beings by nature. And so... Um, well, and, and, and you know, related to that, let's talk about this time period that he's, that, that he's living. The Catholic Church had broken down, in, mm-hmm. in, as you know. At, at one point, that was the official faith of everybody in right. France, and that united everybody. The, that 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 has collapsed at this time. It collapsed during the French Revolution. Uh, now it reemerged under Napoleon a little bit, but uh, but it's never the strong. It's never Christendom again. It's never right. that strong uh, power. Uh, and I think that 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 created a hole. That losing that that shared experience created a hole in society, and made people more individualistic. Yeah. And uh, interestingly enough, I think he would argue that that individual individualism, being an individual, is is a negative. Yeah. Well, and and something that um, Durkheim just kind of glosses over is any means by which the individual can disrupt the system. Yeah. Um, you know, he he very much studied acts by individuals, um, but studied them as groups. So so I guess we can take suicide from there. Um, yeah. He did a, a lot of study on suicide. Suicide was his most important book. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he did a lot of study on suicide and he, so this is a, a very personal act, or at least that's what we think of now. That's what we think of where we're at, um, is that it is a personal choice made by an individual due to circumstances that the individual is, either has going on in their close-knit, yeah. uh, close-knit part of their lives or internally within themselves. However, the way that Durkheim looked at it was... Um, as each individual who committed suicide was doing so because of what was going on in society around he them. He did. He, he gave two main categories. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. He, he had and he had some good facts for it. I know he, he's been called into question in, in the modern era as we have more statistics. Right. But honestly, if you look at, at at what he had available to him, I think he had a logical argument. Mm-hmm. Right. Because he looked around. He, he he looked at the United Kingdom or, or Great Britain at the time. And he saw that the suicide rates in Great Britain had doubled right. since the Industrial Revolution. And then he looks over at the Dutch nations, which mm-hmm. were even more industrialized, and their suicide rate was four times higher than, than Great Britain's. Right. Mm-hmm. So he looked at that, and, and, and he drew the conclusion that the common denominator here was more industrial mm-hmm. industrialization, uh, which led to more individualism and uh, and, and higher uh uh, un- unhappiness, yeah, and, and 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 an increased suicide rate. Well, and a, a breakdown of the uh, web that connects you with the society around you. Well, and and one of the big criticisms of his work, and I think it's a valid criticism, is that he had fallen prey to the uh, and I'm probably gonna mess up sociological fallacy, and what that means is that he had looked at data statistics on large numbers of people. And then from that data, tried to infer things about the individual lives of the people he was studying. Right. And, and I think that is valid uh, to, to look at. Now, I think there, there's interesting correlation, like you pointed out, Mike, but to try to infer something about the internal states of those people from the fact that they have, you know... Uh, yeah, I think you have to um, take a look and find where your anomalies are. You're going to have outliers in that and say, okay, this person had just experienced this thing that really had nothing to do with their social web. Well, there, um, there, there's also the fact that, that we, we now understand 
there, there's a logical fallacy that, that philosophers look at. Mm-hmm. Uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc. After it, therefore, because of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Just because because something happens before something does not mean that that it that it's you know it causes yeah. it. Right. Uh, John, you would put that differently. You would say uh, what was uh, correlation, correlation like, yeah. does not prove causation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Same thing, right? Yeah. And I think that's the um, the logical fallacy that he, that he falls into, and it's easy to fall into. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I I think you know part of what they're pointing out there, and 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 I I'm not disagreeing with you, Mike, but. To say that there is a correlation between industrialized nations and suicide, I think he could point to his research and say that is a thing. But I think where he goes too far is to say, and that correlation then says that they're feeling sad because they're not around their family. Right. They may be feeling sad because they lost the family farm due yeah. to the fast shift. Well, but, but you know, but wouldn't that be be because of industrial industrialization? Well, that's fine. And to say that there's a correlation between industrialization and suicide is fine. What he's saying is. And be, that is because people tend to feel this way, right. and we can then infer these other things will cause it. it but, that you know, there, there, there's, there's evidence today that supports this as well. I mean, uh, are you referencing the mice and the cocaine? Uh, I'm, re- I'm, I'm referencing the fact that Japan has the highest suicide rate of any industrialized nation in the world. Oh, okay. Uh, and and you know, you, it's the most industrial, and the, and the, and the one that's industrialized the rapidest. They've had, they've had the most change in the shortest period of time, and their suicide rate has exploded. Well, and that's fine. And I think what that may show is that it's the rapid change that's causing the suicide rate. Because you would expect... Not capitalism. If it was capitalism, there'd be this enormous suicide rate in America. And we yeah. just it, it's just really not there. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's probably true. Uh, well, while we're talking about this, this, uh, this book he had, Suicide... Uh, uh, if I can jump in here, he had a uh, he, he had five reasons why he, why he suggested this, uh, mm-hmm. and I kind of wanted to touch on this. I don't I don't know if I'm jumping. That's I jumping cool. Them? I just want to talk about mice and cocaine. Okay, later. okay. Well, well, talk about yours first, then. Go ahead. Okay, fine. Um, she loves both. That's really all she wants to say. <laughs> mice are yeah, cuddly, yes. and cocaine makes you happy. She likes she likes cocaine to, does not make you happy. It makes you miserable sn- eventually. She likes to snort the mice. And snuggle the cocaine. And snuggle the cocaine. <laughs> yeah. It's very soft and powdery. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. No, I'm kidding. Um, so anyway. <laughs> what? Okay. So anyway, there was um, denial. There was a study. And um, th- what they were looking at was they were trying to figure out what causes addiction. Is it the substance that causes the addiction or is it some other factor? And the other factor that they were exploring um, was social connection uh socialization um go ahead john i i think we jumped the gun a little bit because this what you're talking about is actually two experiments the the main experiment and the rebuttal so the main experiment actually came out with results that seemed to support the substance and all they did was lock mice in a cage and give them access to drugs and watch them you know drug abuse themselves to death um and it was the the fact that there wasn't a good control on that that led to the experiment I think you're referring to. And I think that background is important because it's the, the contrast between the experiments that I think really starts to pull up data. I just want to put that in there. The meta study of those two studies combined. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. So anyway. So anyway. Um, so what they were looking at was, um, was it the substance or was it... Um, the socialization and, and John's kind of giving you a background on those two studies there. Um, and I have lost my train of thought now. Want me to talk about the second experiment then? Okay. So the first experiment just took, took a mice, uh, across a multiple, mouse. A, ma- a mouse, a mice, whatever. We'll be a mice today. Anyway, took a mice and, and in multiple <laughs> cages, put a single mouse in that wait, wait, hold on. He, he, he put he put a single mouse in multiple cages. Did you hear that? Yeah, across multiple cages. A single mouse in mul- Did he cut it up into small pieces? What? Uh, I can stab him if you want. I, I, I'm telling you. So he put. Oh, we can cut him into multiple pieces and put him in different rooms <laughs> or different holes. He put a single mouse in each cage across multiple cages, and then lectured them on their grammar. Um, <laughs> and they committed suicide. Yes, and I understand instantly. Um, <laughs> no. Good. You're going to write the, uh, the sequel to his book, yeah. Suicide, now? Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, in there, put two water bottles, one laced with drugs, and then one that did not have drugs, and watch how much they used each one. And, and they quickly developed a strong taste for the bottle with drugs in it. 
and, oh, shit. and use the drugs to their own death eventually. And the conclusion of the study was, well, people like drugs. They'll go to drugs and kill themselves, you know? Well, uh, uh, yeah, criticism... Drugs are super addicting and yada, yeah. yada, yada. A criticism of the study was that they were not in their natural habitat yeah. and that these mice were probably depressed. So another person made what he called... Mouse utopia. Yeah, mouse utopia. Toys and games, and there were lots of mice in the cage and, and all this. Made this really nice mouse lots playground. Of lots yeah. of mou- mouse boning. Yeah. And did the same but thing. Like rat porn. And what, Mouse porn. Oh. Yes, m- mice are completely different. Anyway, they like better porn. Anyway, so so in the second cage where, where, where there was a lot of social activity, they also put two water bottles and found that the vast majority of the mice ignored the drug-laced water bottle with a small minority actually going over to that water bottle and, and doing the same behavior, isolating themselves and killing themselves. Approximately the same percentage that we see in society today. Yeah. But they also realized when studying those mice specifically that those tend to be the mice that isolated themselves naturally. And so the contrast in these two shuddy, studies tends to show, at least for this drug and, you know, uh, across mice, that the thing that was driving them to, to crushing addiction wasn't the chemicals, it was the isolation. Is that more or less sum up where you were going with that? Mm-hmm. All right, so that's mice and uh, cocaine. There yeah, you go. I was actually going to reference it back to the study if you'd like to do that as well. I can do that. I'd go ahead. Yeah, I was going to reference it back to Durkheim and suicide. Okay, uh, actually, go ahead. Oh, I forgot where I was going with it. <laughs> okay. I was hoping but, but, but you I mean, remembered. But I mean, it, it, if it's if it's the isolation that causes it, wouldn't that fall right back into Durkheim's idea that as society collapses, or as as the social norms collapse, people become more isolated? Yeah. Well, and, and he had some interesting ideas on on families and and family values. He actually saw it as quite a detrimental thing that children were getting jobs away from their parents, not going to the family business, yeah, and, yeah. and kind of separating and finding social circles that didn't overlap with their family's social circles. I do question the logic here. Is it really important that your social circles overlap or that you have a strong, thriving social circle? I mean, does that connection it, to the people that share genes I, with you really matter? Well, I, think I, think it's, I, 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 I think it's hard to judge what was being said by Durkheim back in, in you know, in 1820, 18, or, or 1830, or maybe the 1850s. But uh, Durkheim saying this stuff back that time period to judge it with today's eyes mm-hmm. so because th- it was such a new change. So I'm sorry, I, I keep interrupting okay. you. So I think that the reason that Durkheim would have made that argument was because he feared chaos in the system. Mm-hmm. And the chaos being, um, and, and this was one of the things that he cited, but the chaos being that whenever your social circle um, ceases to have a strong overlap with your family social circle, that you are more likely to branch out and do specialized things different than what your family was already doing. So if your social circle primarily consists of your family and your family are... Bakers. Bakers. Fine. Um, so your social sam- your family social circle you're all bakers, you are more likely to grow up and become a baker yourself. And as long as everybody is staying close to their families and their families' uh, professions, then society gets to continue in equilibrium, which is what he believed that society was always trying to achieve. Um, And each generation is just going to perpetuate, and the system is going to eventually both find equilibrium and maintain it. Whereas whenever you are stepping too far outside of that, then this person who came from a family of bakers might uh, throw an N in there and become a banker. And this person who was um, coming from a family of farmers is now going to be, uh, I'm I'm sticking with money, I guess, an investor. Um, You know, and, and I think it's interesting, and I think this gets back to judging it within its time, how? And then everybody wants to be a video game programmer. Yeah, whatever. Sorry. Anyway, but judging that within... I want to be a baker. Well, I mean... Yeah, you know. <laughs> hey, Mr. Alex. Producer, you want to talk? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I think the thing that he failed to see, and you have to kind of look at it within the time frame that he was talking about, 
was how fluid and rapid the economy would need to be one day yeah. to where that kind of, I don't know if that kind of economy could stay in equilibrium yeah. in a modern society. It, 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 it's, it's fascinating to me when you see his argument because I think mm-hmm. his argument is logical. Mm-hmm. But logical doesn't always mean it's right. It's stagnant. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I think I think you're right. I, I was going to argue with you, mm-hmm. but but I think you're right. One uh, of the biggest criticisms of his work is that it does not account for social change. Well, it, in it, addition it, to not accounting for the individual, it's very much a product of its time period. I think yeah. it, I think it's a good explanation of the problems in France in, the, in that time period. Right. I don't think it's a good explanation for the problems of everything. Ironically, for somebody who uh, devoted his life to taking things to a more macro scale and exploring society as a whole, he didn't go big enough. It's really hard to do. Oh, yeah, uh, spe- absolutely. Especially in the time period before Yeah, before with their lack of communication yeah, yeah, yeah. ability. So let's go back to this book, Suicide, because, uh, again, that's, that is the most important book he ever, he ever uh, did. It's the one that you, that, that, that you look at in your, your psychology classes when you're in, in uh, or your sociology classes, in, particularly in education classes. Uh, he was trying to explain, the question he was really trying to answer is, if capitalism makes you richer, why does it also seem to make people more miserable? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and the misery index he's talking about was suicide rate. Right. Mm-hmm. And he comes up with five reasons here uh, why what, what this is. And I want to, we've been, been through some of them, but let's talk about them as we go through it. The first one he says is that, uh, that, that capitalism forces you forces people to become individuals. Mm -hmm. So individualism is a big thing. And he says uh, that since traditional societies were closely related to the clan, people identified themselves as, I am this. I am Catholic. I am am a baker. Mm -hmm. I am, this is what I am. And all of a sudden, you're not that anymore. You're... You know, you're a banker. You're something else. And you're not part of that larger group. Mm -hmm. And he saw that as a problem because suddenly your success or your failure are no longer a societal problem or a societal success. It's your fault. And yes, you can, you can succeed greatly. And if you succeed greatly, it's your individualism that did it, and you get all the credit. Mm-hmm. But if you fail under capitalism, it's your fault too. Yeah. See, what I find to be interesting there. Um, is when you take a look at something else that that he um, kind of outlined was a comparison of mechanical solidarity and, or, uh, solidarity and organic solidarity. Um, and so the thing that you see in an industrialized capitalistic uh, so- society is, well, I guess mechanical, so- mechanical solidarity is something that we saw in in times further back yeah. um, before, Shared experiences. yeah, exactly. And so everybody is self-sufficient um, within the family group, primarily um, or communally sufficient anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, but within your small group, um, and this is you know tip- typically is just your family unit. You are um, providing all the food that that fa- that or that structure needs. Um, <coughs> you know. Taking care of the children. Yeah, somebody, care somebody's of the farming. Somebody's a wheelwright. Somebody's yeah. making clothes. Yeah. But any person within that that small group um, can kind of fill the place of any of those others. They are not highly specialized. Yeah. However, um, the organic solidarity. Con- oh, one of the things I really liked <laughs> about that, uh, or that I found fascinating, was that he attributed mechanical solidarity for kind of um, highly emotional reactions. And a mob mentality whenever somebody yeah. does break those social norms. Well, that's which, a whole which other makes thing. sense when you're coming out of the French Revolution and, and right. you know five separate uh, uh, national systems right before this. You know, right. Um, so the organic solidarity kind of comes from uh, or comes about more in a capitalistic society where everybody is highly specialized and they do rely so much on each other. And I find it fascinating that individualism is attributed um, to a higher suicide rate in exactly that kind of structure that he's talking about because you do rely in that structure on everybody else around you. And it isn't as much about the individual as I think that he portrays it here. No, I I think he's right. I I could really... This particular argument, I think he he was right on. I think the fact that he says that that... For the first time in history, 
your success or your failure is entirely dependent on you. But he simultaneously okay. said that it's not. No, but, but, no, no, no he, I, I think he's, no, I don't think he did. I, I didn't get that as, as I read it. Oh, okay. What I got from him was, was very much a clear argument that the problem is, yes, pe- some people are going to be extremely happy because they are successful. They are doing great, and they get the credit for it. Mm-hmm. Other people, in a, in a capitalist system, somebody has to fail. It has to. That's the way the system works. And if you fail, it's your fault. You mm-hmm. can't blame anybody else. Well, in the old system, you know, if your crops failed, you know what? Everybody's crops failed. Everybody's equally miserable. It goes back to, to, to a statement John made on one of the shows a while back. People, it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not whether or not you're, you, know, you have a lot, you're wealthy that matters. It's the amount of wealth in exactly. relation to other people yeah. that yeah. matters. Well, everybody's equally miserable. We're all okay. Yeah. But if I'm miserable and you're not, my life sucks. Yeah. yeah, I think he's got a good argument here. Yeah, uh, so I, I, I can see this because I, I felt that way. Mm-hmm. I've been that guy right there where I look around and go, uh, you know, my buddy Mark is doing so much better than I am, and he's the same age as I am. What, what am I doing wrong? I've been that that guy. Yeah, and then I've been the guy that looked around and went, but you know, this other buddy of mine's, you know, waiting tables, and I'm doing. I'm, I'm a fucking success. Right. Yeah, I, I really think one of the, you know, and this is kind of getting off the show a little bit, but I think I think one of the keys to happiness is to stop trying to barter with happiness and, and start trying to, to realize that your needs and what's going to make you happy and what's going to make someone else happy are not related. I, I, I think... Uh, uh, it's hard to do, though. Louis yeah. C.K., I, I really love the way he said it. Uh, he was... He, he, he was when he famously says, "Sit in that chair and watch me masturbate." No, the, the other one, the oh, okay. other one. That was good too. That was good too. <laughs> no, uh, he was. It was. It was on a show, and he was talking to his daughter, and, and the daughter was complaining about. I hope he didn't say that to his daughter. <laughs> he was talking about the nicer toy that this other girl had, and he said, "You know, you should never look." into your uh, neighbor's bowl unless you're checking to see that they have enough. Otherwise, worry about your own happiness. That's a Jewish proverb. Yeah, Is it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was not an original yeah. thought. But, 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 Louis C.K., the he famous made it rabbi, yeah. said, yeah. you know. Uh, <laughs> so individualism it, 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 was, his, was his first explanation. Right. Okay. His second one was that, that capitalism raises the hopes of society. And I, I, I found this interesting, too. What he said was, you look around, and I think it's related to the individual. He says, there is limitless luxury available to you if you play your cards right. In capitalism, if you do everything right... It's the American dream. It's the American dream. You have limitless luxury. And because of that, it's easy to become dissatisfied with your reality because you look around and go, but I could have all of this, Mm -hmm. and this is all I have. Even if you have more than you've ever had in your life, more than you ever would have had in the other system. More than you need. More than you need, I could have had more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And and I think there's some truth to that, too. I saw an interview of Ted Turner. You know, Ted Turner is one of the richest men in the world. And uh, he he said in there that that, that he looks at at the Fortune 500 every year, and he looks at it as a scoreboard. He goes, Warren Buffett's ahead of me. Uh, you know, all these people are ahead of me, and and and, and I I feel bad about this. The guy's got millions and or billions of dollars, and he looks at it and says, "But I'm behind the scoreboard." I think that's what he's talking about about capitalism raising hopes. Well, and I'll tell you that. one that I had to deal with. Uh, I had two instances. Um, so I spent a couple hundred on Bitcoin, uh, not a whole lot, and and I wanted I had two things I really wanted to do uh, that have made me happy since. One is I want to get into brewing, so I I sold some Bitcoin and bought a brew setup, made good money on the Bitcoin, so I got it fairly cheap from my cash investment. And two, I got my bathroom remodeled, which was needed, and I I have a bathroom now that I like. Yeah. Shortly after I did that, Bitcoin went from $700 to $20,000. Yeah. And I was like, well, I could have had, you know, $60,000 or $80,000. dollars but I could have gotten all the other repairs on the house done. (laughs) And I felt that. I felt like, man, you know, I mean, but... If I'm going to be honest here... You made money. I bought Bitcoin, I had fun trading it, and then I made money and got two things I really wanted. What do I have to complain about, you know? Uh, Which is a perspective that I think people find difficult mm -hmm. in a consumer-driven society. Yeah. I think you're right. Consumerism-driven. The third point is one I I want you to talk about, John, because Mm -hmm. you brought something up when we were... uh, discussing before the show mm-hmm. that I found interesting. His third point was that he believes that people have too much freedom. 
mm-hmm. and you said some things that were interesting. What, what, you want to talk about, about, about what this was? Yeah, so uh, I think that he he kind of um, mixes th- You know, I'm going to have to ask you, uh, give me a quick reminder, because I remember talking to you. I don't remember everything I said. Um, okay. Well, well I, I, I don't remember the details. I just remember sitting here listening to you going, man, that was, that was interesting. Yeah. But what he's, what he's talking about here, he says that, 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 that the freedom undermines our social norms. It creates a society of individuals with very little in common. Oh, yes. I was talking about the stamps. That, yeah. That's the stamps, what it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, I actually quite agree with what he's saying in that, that capitalism can create unhappiness uh, from, from the perspective of this same kind of symptom that we talked about where people are unhappy with the the way things are going around them and don't realize uh, uh, what they have. And I think a, a common fallacy that people fall into with money. So here's where I disagree with him. I disagree with his conclusion of, like, tone down capitalism. I think what it needs to be is an educational strive because I think what happens with people is they get so caught up in the capitalism that they forget about all the things that they were wanting to do with capitalism. So the example I was giving you was imagine two brothers, an older one and a younger one, uh, and the older one goes off to war at a time when phones aren't easily accessible, and he decides that he wants to start writing letters to his brother to talk to him. You know, why not? And to do this, he has to inter- interface with, with the postal system and get stamps. Now, maybe we could imagine he could hand deliver it through a long trek or find some private person who's going there. But probably he's going to use stamps for this. Just like probably to achieve your dreams, you're going to use money. And he starts getting stamps. And one day, maybe he finds a really rare stamp or makes a good trade on a stamp he has for some other stamps. And Like, he enjoys it. He, he gets a rush because he, he's made this cool stamp deal. And he starts really getting into collecting stamps and maybe saving stamps for the future and maybe not wanting to send stamps to his brother because then he has to get rid of his stamp collection. And he becomes obsessed with the idea of collecting stamps and forgets that all along the goal was to write letters to his brother. He loses sight of that for the game of collecting stamps. Yeah. And I think I think what needs to happen is we need to educate people that capitalism is the the historically hands down, no question, best way to accumulate wealth. But don't forget when you're doing that what your goals were in the first place. It's also a pretty good way to fail. Yeah. Yeah. And but- yet the means by which we tend to educate people in this society is is specifically designed to create people to go and get jobs to accumulate wealth to continue to economically contribute to society. To the yeah, state. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because if you're collecting stamps and for every hundred stamps you collect, the state gets a stamp. Well, they want you to really get into that stamp collecting business. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, excuse me. I got to tell you, that I, I'm, I was laughing the whole time you're doing this because we, we've joked about how I read my, my notes in, and they're always, mm-hmm. they can't understand my language. <laughs> I'm sitting here looking at it, and, and, and Anna's over here editing my notes and correcting <laughs> my grammar on this. It's, it's amazing. Um, number four, the fourth big reason, and I found this, this to be, be interesting. He talks about atheism being, being a cause. Which the is atheist. Fa- which is fascinating because he is an atheist. Yes. Yeah. But he does something like... Uh, who Very was, I similar forgot, to Nietzsche. Yeah, what Nietzsche said. He, he says in here that, 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 that while he is an atheist... He appreciates the power of religion to un- unite society. It's very similar to the idea of even if there is no God, we should pretend like there is. Yeah. Well, I I've think said, that was his idea. Yeah, I've said for a long time, one of the biggest reasons that I think um, religion, organized religion was ever created was to control people and to create the kind of society that you ex- that you think should exist. You know, if, if, if you've kind of turned away from religion and you're looking for that euphoric experience you used to get in church, I found two really good ways to do that is cocaine and mice. I mean, they just really... <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. It's really hard to get the mice up your nose, though. Yes. Uh, well, and I'll say this, like, at a time when I was feeling really a-religious... Um, I was also feeling really socially disconnected Mm -hmm. and I joined the church and I started going regularly. I started getting involved in stuff outside of the regular services. Um, I picked a church that was highly socially connected within the greater community um, for the purpose of creating more social connections for myself. And it fucking helped like a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, 
so does uh, joining a health club. You know, it's just yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it's whatever. Yes, whatever but that works. was free, and I was broke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm in that weird place where where I'm, I, you know, I I'm a I believe in God. I consider myself a Christian, but I'm not, I don't consider myself religious. I have a real hard time with mm-hmm. organized religion. CrossFit. So, uh, CrossFit. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I'm, I'm, I'm a CrossFit Christian. Yeah. All right. The fifth one is, uh, and we've kind of already talked about this, so I'm just going to throw it out here. The idea that there was a weakened national identity and a weakened family identity. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this created uh, uh, a, a system where people just felt very separated from society, not part of the whole. Mm-hmm. So with these five, five things, he says, naturally... Depression is going to happen. People are going to be more unhappy. The misery index is going to go right. up, and suicide rates are going to go up. Yeah. And if I look at, if I look at these, at all this, and then I go, this was written by a guy in France in the late 1800s. This makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. If I look at this and go, this does not. You're trying to apply this to the United States in 2018. This doesn't make sense to me. I agree with both of those. So, yeah. Uh, you, you know, so that, that that's kind of kind of where I where I was with this. Um, so those are his five reasons for the uh, you know you know the misery index there. So what I find to be really interesting here, um, and and I think this is a great place to transition into it is I actually wanted to kind of discuss the beer. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's what we wanted. That's great. Good because I just finished mine. There's another one. Here, should I? I could. Oh, that's a partial. That's fantastic. Thank you, producer Alex. Mm-hmm. All Producer right. man you know, is I, uh, what he's called. I, Thank I, you. I got into bed at six o'clock this morning. So Why? Uh, I, Was that for the second time? I I had a long. You got up at five and then went back at no, six. No, no. I, well, I, then you broke it. You I, did it wrong. I worked the pool hall until three, and then you know got home and had to wind down. And uh, yeah, that's you so did it wrong. The beer is a little um, shocking to me today because is of it? that. Yeah, I had a couple too many last night. So. Oh, nice. I see. Yeah. Uh, I, my sister showed up with wine last night, so and you, you didn't have told call? us your fucking sister was in town because uh, 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 we kind of like her. Yeah. <laughs> we don't go there because you're there. But if your sister's there, we'll come. <laughs> well, he's there all the time. Too. I know, always, always. <laughs> all right, so who wants to start this discussion? I love this beer, mm-hmm. like a lot. Um, so as it goes, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, it's it's going to have a little bit of that sour funk, but Goza's, at least in my experience, tend to be on the, um, they're more in the kind of transition from a regular beer to a sour. Um, they're not as funky. Um, they do have a lot more of the elements of, of a more traditional beer to them. So it, it's not as jarring unless apparently you've been drinking the night before. Um, this one, whenever I poured it initially, the smell was fantastic. Like oh, I was man. pouring it probably like eight inches from my nose and I could just boob smell height. it. What? Boob height. Yes. Boob the height, boob yeah. height pour. <laughs> boob height pour. Yes. Um, Cause I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the things that I noted were grapefruit and some sort of candy, but I couldn't figure it out until I took Jolly the first Rancher. sip. Oh, that too. Okay, yeah, actually. So until I took the first sip, at which point I tasted more peach, because grapefruit's got kind of that bitterness to it, and I didn't actually taste that so much, and I tasted peach and starburst. You, it's going to be shocked when you find out what fruit it, it actually is. It's brewed with watermelon and sea salt. Mm. Okay. Okay. I could taste that now. Yeah, that, yeah. that actually makes sense. But um, it does taste taste very peachy. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, so anyway, I have thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a 4.6 ABV, so even having finished one, I'm not feeling too mm-hmm. uh, too inebriated. Um, and to give it a rating, um, I think it's a little too fruity for my personal taste. Um I know after, what was the last beer? Two beers ago, we had Dragons and Yum Yums. And I will go ahead and give a disclaimer there. My taste for that beer has gone down since I've had more of it. We suspect it. (laughs) Fuck off. (laughs) Fuck off. I'm pretty sure we said that that day during the writing. Yeah. It didn't go down that much. Uh (laughs) Um, But I do still really enjoy this beer, and I'm going to give it a 2.9. Two nine. Two nine. You right. John? I'll go ahead. I, I guess I guess we're gonna have one of those days. Um, 
So I'm, I've really enjoyed. What is your problem, John? I've really enjoyed this beer. Um, this it's got an excellent flavor. It is a fruitier beer, but it still manages to taste like a beer, and I love that. Um, I'm actually surprised. I actually started looking on the box to see if this was like a seasonal release. This is one of the, their regular beers, and that's really impressive to me. The quality that's coming out of this for a regular off-the-shelf beer, beer you can get any time. <laughs> Um, and that's actually going to push it up a little bit for me because I, I expect that kind of quality out of a, a seasonal release. I don't expect it in, in your stock beers. Um, uh, it is a ghost. I think it has a, a great balance of, of sour and sweet. Um, this is going to be a good introductory sour for anyone yes. you, you want to try uh, to get in. And the, the sourness actually masks some of the fruitiness. Not that you can't taste it if you're looking for it, but that it still feels like a beer. All that said, I'm going to give this a 4.0. I think this is a great beer. <laughs> See, one of those days. Uh, I think this is a great beer, and I would recommend it to anyone trying to grab it off 4.0. Yeah. yeah, you're drunk. Um, okay, I'm okay. glad I'm not crazy here. You're, you're crazy too. Fuck you, Mike. This. Uh, what are you doing? Shh. <laughs> this is a good beer. Uh, yeah. It, uh, it, it, it's. Uh, um, I think Jolly Rancher was a good explanation for it. When you mm-hmm. when you get that, it's got that that feel to it. It's a sweet beer. It's a little sweeter than I like. I'm yes. not. A, I'm not a cra- crazy about real sweet beers, but it's. It, it, it's very good. It's smooth. There's no bell curve to it. It's it's a steady steady flavor yeah. all the way through. Which is not what I'm usually looking for, but it's it works for this mm-hmm. beer. Uh, it's real light. It's real thin. I really, really like this beer, uh, but it's it's not a masculine beer at all. No. A, as a man, I, I I feel like I need to be putting on Elton John music when I'm drinking this. And there's uh, nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I love Elton John, but uh, so you, never I'm not through yet. Shh, be quiet, women. Women, be quiet. <laughs> I all will right. stab you so hard. Lord, go. women are like children. They should be seen and not heard. Stop. Oh. All right. Oh. I won't break things today. I'm not going to break things today. I'm going to stab All right, people, so, but I won't break things. Um, honestly, I, I, th- I think this is an outstanding beer, and uh, I, would, uh, I would drink this particularly in the heat of the summer. I am going to go with a – I'm going to go with a 3-3. Three, 3-3. Three. Yeah. Three, three. Okay. Yeah. That's a reasonable rating. Yeah. Um, Even though you're a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> so on the fuck date lawnmower scale, this beer will get you laid unless you're Mike. Unless you're Mike, I guess. I guess for the date, uh, I'm going to say early and often. Uh, this is definitely a first date beer. Uh, early and often, which is also what we say about the fuck category. Early yeah, and often. Early and often. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely a first date beer. It'll apparently get you laid. Um, and the cool thing is that if the relationship turns into anything because it's not seasonal, you can get it sometime <laughs> and and bring it home to your significant other. Um, so uh, yeah. I'm going to say first date and, and anywhere else you want to scatter it. Yeah, as far as lawnmower goes, I would drink this on my lawnmower. I, it, it, it's light enough that I could really enjoy it on a hot day. Uh, again, you're not going to feel super masculine drinking this, but it's uh, – it, Well, it's you're a, mowing your lawn, so. It's a, yeah, it offsets itself. If you want to mow your lawn in a tutu, this is absolutely perfect as well. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. I'm trying to offend everybody today. That's my goal in case you're wondering. I'm, I, I'm, That's going I'm in the post. Mike would mow his lawn in a tutu with this beer. I would. I would. He doesn't care. I don't care. Uh, so we had a, what, what was the ratings now? Uh, a 3.3 and some <laughs> bullshit. 4.0, 3.3 and like a 1.8 or something. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, 0.6 or something. <laughs> I don't Weird. I will function. torpedo all okay. of you. Y'all want to know what it is on Beer Advocate? What's that? 3.89. Hey. I'm not that far off. You two are crazy. I'm stabbing everyone today. <laughs> Beer advocate. Ah, oh, man. Beer advocate's always off. It's always inflated. Yeah. Everything's inflated on Beer Advocate. All right, so... You're inflated on Beer Advocate. <laughs> Sometimes I'm inflated on beer. Okay. That's also true. Hey, are we going to go back to the show or are we going to sit here and bicker and bitch? Yes. She is looking at me with the eyes of death right now. If I told you lately that I'm I love you... Turn off your microphone. So There's anyway. no one else above you. There is, uh, so, weekend national identity and family identity, uh, weekend social connections, social web, yada, yada, yada. So the thing that I wanted to take from that was, um, we have seen drastic social change in, in the way that things are structured, in my opinion. Maybe y'all's opinion differs. I'm sure it does, Mike. Um, but we have seen significant social change in the way that things are structured. 
And I kind of wanted to ask, do we think that we are currently falling in to or out of some sort of social equilibrium, according to Durkheim? Um, or uh, do we think that, well, not or, and. And um, given particularly with the internet and the ease of communication that people are having these days, are we kind of circumventing the looser family connections and, um, and looser national identity by developing the same social connections that Durkheim deemed to be necessary in our kind of more niche interest social groups? So I think it's really interesting. If you look at his original conclusions and research on capitalism, the United States should be in complete disarray socially. I mean, we should just be in so, so, some kind of hellhole. And, you know, I, well, I, we did elect Donald Trump. There's that. Uh, but I really don't think we are. On, a lot on, of riots lately. Yeah. But uh, so I'm going there. I really don't think we are on, on, on the scale looking back, but there's actually been a really large social movement that is pushing us back toward his ideals. Yeah. And we're starting to see some of the disarray he described in the move toward capitalism from the move toward his ideas. So I think that maybe we are starting to move into his category. Maybe a pendulum. But it may be showing that it's the movement that causes the issue, not the spot you're in. Yeah. Well, and that was actually something that I, I wanted to address a little bit. Um, and, and I guess we touched on a little bit earlier was he was looking at, at a, fairy, a fairly narrow um, time frame. Well, it, it was a brand new thing. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so he was looking at the whole time period, but it was... Right. No, <laughs> but it was still small. Um, and that I think that... Um, one of the things that he wasn't accounting for was the upheaval necessary to change structures. Yeah. And and I do think that he was fairly uh, correct in the whole equilibrium thing, but I think no matter what system you're in, you're um, tending towards some sort of equilibrium until something knocks you off kilter and you switch. Okay. So, so what I'm getting out of this, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because honestly, I, I'm it's the first time I've thought about it like this, mm -hmm. is that it's not that his his uh, his results are wrong. It's that he looks at the wrong thing that caused it. It wasn't the fact that it was a shift to capitalism that caused the dissatisfaction. It was that there was a shift at all that caused it. And now there's a shift in the other direction, and it's causing it again. That tells us that it's just change in general that causes it. Yeah. That would be my conclusion. I think there be need to be some more scrutiny there's of the idea, you know. No, we yeah. don't do scrutiny. We, yeah. do, we, do, we do beer and I just and regurgitate all my the ideas. Yeah, exactly. Yes. But, yeah, so I, I, I would think that that... Yeah, that's an interesting you know. idea. Yeah. Well, he was smack dab in the middle of the industrial it's revolution. Almost like, it's almost like a chaos theory of it. You know? yeah, yeah, it is. It's, um, but yeah, so he was smack dab in the middle of the industrial sure, revolution. Sure. And he was trying to say how things were going to be at the end of it as though he was at the end of it. Um, and he most definitely was not. He was doing science with incomplete data. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so then moving to... Through no fault of his own, I should say. Uh, it, you know, it's not, it's not like he was ignoring yeah. data. You should have the data. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's easy in the time period that you're in to go, well, this looks done. Yeah. I think we're done. Yeah. And then call it done and do do things with that data. Yeah. And walk to the back room and realize there's a whole wall missing. Yeah. You know. Um, the back room being the future in this case. Um, I thought it was a euphemism. For, no, so anyway. Never mind. So moving on to the second question then. Um, do we think that with the internet and... Um, the other means by which we have to build social connections, are we finding means of replacing the social connections that Durkheim felt to be so ne uh, necessary to our happiness and bringing us further down on the misery scale um, in things like... Um, you know, internet forums and things like that. Facebook, Snapchat, y Facebook, you know, well, Twitter. Yeah. yeah, we can we can actually talk about Facebook on both sides. Pornhub, yeah. but, Pornhub. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, um, furry the furry communities. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, in in a time back then, they would have. Are you been listening, producer? Breaking. <laughs> 
all sorts of social mores, and and they would not have been able to connect with a community that would f- make them feel um, like they were part of something. They would feel very isolated and on their own, and probably more likely to commit suicide in that time with those sure, types of connections. So is the internet providing a means to supplement those necessary connections or is it actually feeding into a feeling of disconnection? I think it is, but I think, I think it's is a double edged sword. That was an either or I'm, I'm getting there. Oh, okay, man, it's just rough no, today. No, woman, uh, woman, <laughs> but, but I, 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 I got your back. I think it is, but I think it's a double edged sword. So while I do think it's it's providing us more connections, I think it's it's creating the same kind of issues that we saw with capitalism. That is to say, where people before um, were happy um, to have the same amount of money, now there's almost a competitiveness and economy around social connections. So you may have a hundred friends on Facebook, and you might think that's great. I got a hundred people I can reach out to and talk to, you know, maybe 50 of those you actually want to talk to, but I got a hundred people I can reach out and talk to, but you look at your friend and they have 3000 Facebook friends. Like, Oh, well fuck this. I need more faith. Now what are you going to do with 3000 friends? You have nothing to do with 3000. And then you look back and you realize that you're getting the same amount of interact. Like they've got way more, more friends than you and you're realizing that you're getting the same amount of interaction as them and you're like damn I feel bad for them now it's become very it therapeutic keeps, for you isn't it I'm, fuck off <laughs> I'm saying like it goes back and yeah, forth but it, I, yeah I gotta tell you a month ago I made a, a, a I did, it wasn't even a conscious decision I just logged off Facebook and haven't been back on it I have not looked at my Facebook page in a month and I am the happiest I've been in three years do you feel more or less connected I feel I, I don't even care oh. I just I, I don't I, I, I reached a point where where Facebook actually felt like a, a an anchor around me but like mm-hmm. where I was checking it so often and it was so I just but I, I, just I shut off I think we've yeah. shifted from a monetary economy to a social economy mm-hmm. where it's like I have to like be really successful socially and I think there is something to be said and it's fine with getting as much social connection as you need and then saying I don't need to continue to drive this machine. And so I think, yes, it does supplement. Yes, it, it provides a way to be incredibly socially successful or mildly, depending on what you want. But it also drives this competitive uh, machine in a different way. Yeah. Well, and, and I don't even think it's necessarily the, the uh, competitive nature. But one of the things that we have... Um, that we have seen and that people are studying right now is um, that people's connection to their online social circle is drastically harming their connection with their personal social, social circle Mm -hmm. and is, and like I said, the study of this is ongoing Um, We haven't been able to see because of the longevity of social media and things like that, or the amount of time that's been around. um, We have not been able to do long-term studies on it yet. But one of the things that we are starting to see is that despite having these huge social connections online, people are getting fewer and fewer personal connections and feeling less connected generally. Um, so I think that we are probably in the same situation that Durkheim was, uh, with the industrial revolution and those, those changes he was going through. The information revolution. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I think that we can speculate as to what we think the case may be. Are you writing a book on this? No. I just... I've noticed I'll call that when, it I've noticed social that, suicide. Notice that when I when I ask that frequently, you end up writing, saying yes, you'll write a book on it. So you've yeah. got like six books you've got to write now. I know <laughs> it's okay though. She's I'm finally learned. She's them. she's hit her yeah, limit. She goes, no, no, <laughs> yeah, no. Um, but anyway, uh, so I'd ask if John was going to write a book on that, but it involves words. Yeah, I can do he pictures. would totally write a, a book on it, <laughs> and nobody would be able to understand it because he doesn't word well. Picture book pop up. I will write a pop up <laughs> picture book. Thank you on economics. Yes. So I think that we are in a similar place that Durkheim was in. It's in a genius idea. Yep. We should What's do that? this. We should do a this. A pop up picture book on economics. This is a genius idea. Yes. <laughs> I mean, fucking genius. You gonna be on the book? No. No. Okay. I got your back. Awesome. I got your back. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I got. Sorry, what? I, I just got. I got. I got sucked into the idea of a pop-up book on you know, Kinsey and economics and stuff. So anyway, um, I think that we are in a 
similar <coughs> environment that Durkheim was in. Um, he was not in a place where he could see all of the data. Yeah. Um, and I think that we are in a place where we can't see all the data. However, it is fun to speculate on what we think the answers might be. It will be even more fun if hopefully we live long enough to look back and see what the results actually were. Well, you know, suicide rates don't explode. With that, um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've enjoyed it. We hope you have too. Cheers. Well, we're not done yet. What are you? What no, are I we was cheering? done. You were done? We're not even going to give a recommendation or nothing. Well, y'all Gosh. were chasing rabbits. I figured we were fucking done. Anyway, if you want to check our show out... what show was. Huh? I thought that's what our show was. If you want to check out another podcast that that uh, relates to this topic, economics and all this other stuff, what? I'm just waiting. Oh, okay. If you want to check out another podcast or something else that relates to this topic, you can check out the Annex uh, Sociology Podcast. Um, this one comes out uh, every couple weeks, it seems, uh, to every week, and they talk about different sociology. Uh, related topics uh, relate them to current events, news. Uh, so learn more about sociology and uh, check out the podcast. Sounds good to me. Hey, if they want to support the show, John, what can they do? They can check out our Patreon on patreon.com slash sixpackphilosophy. Uh, you can go there and sub- sign up as a patron and get plenty of perks uh, ranging from one dollar all the way up to our five hundred dollars sleep with a producer. Uh, sleep, sleep with a producer. Host. Producer. I will yeah. come producer. Nap with you. You can Pro- sleep with a producer. Producer, we've signed you up. <laughs> He's demanding a thousand dollars now. Oh. He's demanding a thousand. But I will nap with you for five hundred. So I'll nap with you for twenty. For five hundred, five hundred a month, you get a host. But if you want to go the full producer package, up to a thousand. There you go. There you go. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll nap with anybody for hey. money. You can close us off now. I already did. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've enjoyed it, kind of. And we hope you have too. See you next week. Cheers. 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 Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. <laughs>